Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino, the, the Big, Big Dinosaur, Dinosaur Podcast, Podcast, where we cover news, interviews, and discussions of all things dinosaur. Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today's episode is brought to you by TRX Dinosaurs. They have innovative puppets, poseable sculptures, and animatronics. And you can find out more at trxdinosaurs.com. This week, we have an interview with Dr. Elizabeth Rega. She's a professor of anatomy who has consulted on some cool dinosaur projects. And we have Dinosaur of the Day Proceratosaurus. And we have a bunch of dinosaur news. But first, as always, we would like to thank some of our patrons. And this week, we would like to thank Kyle, Brendan, the Tolbert family, Sean Tanagaki, Remy Rodriguez, Marcy, Rohan, Bradley, and Bilal. And Bilal just joined, so thank you. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Really appreciate all your support. And as a quick reminder, we still have our giveaway ongoing. So if you'd like to win our TRX created Velociraptor sculpture, then make sure you click the link in this week's show notes. We're also doing bonus content for our patrons. We've just finished part three out of, I think we're going to do six of all the dinosaurs that have appeared or been mentioned in the Jurassic Park books or Jurassic Park and Jurassic World movies and you know, where they appear, what we know about them and kind of compiling our dinosaur of the days so that you have them all in one place. Yeah, and it's good to review before you see the new movie, for sure. So if you want access to those bonus content, then check out our page at patreon.com slash inodino. Also, last reminder, we're doing a poll of everyone's favorite Jurassic Park, Jurassic World movies, so be sure to vote on our social media channels. And we'll be announcing that after Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. Jumping into the dinosaur news, we have a new article about crocodiles, which usually we don't talk about, but sometimes they're researched largely with sort of the idea of learning more about dinosaurs, which is sort of the case this time. It's a new article by Mehdi Baruzi and others, and published in the Proceedings of the Royal Society B. And what they did is they put five baby Nile crocodiles, which were about two feet long. They didn't say how old they were. Maybe if I knew more about crocodiles, I could guess based, based on, on the size. length. <laughs> I know when they're born, they're just in little tiny eggs. So, you know, they're only what, a few inches long. But two They probably feet. grow fast. Yeah, I would guess so. Maybe they're a year old or less. They get really long. Nile crocodiles, like almost 20 feet. So, yeah, definitely young. But they put five of them into an fMRI, which, if you're not familiar, is a functional magnetic resonance imager and the thing that makes it functional is the fact that it can kind of make more of a video of what's going on in an mri so usually an mri is kind of a static shot of a scan of basically a human most of the time in this case it's a crocodile but usually you're looking for things going on with soft tissue so you might be looking for like growths or broken things or any sort of issues in the brain but with a functional mri Usually what you're doing is you're looking at the brain and you're looking for blood flow and they use blood flow as sort of a correlation for brain activity. So the idea is if you're in a functional MRI and they show you a picture of a cat or something like that, or maybe something that you're afraid of and a certain part of your brain gets increased blood flow, it shows up on the MRI and people might interpret it as saying, oh, all this blood flow flowed <laughs> to this part of the brain when they saw something they were afraid of and therefore that part of the brain is associated with fear or maybe running away or some sort of trauma or you know all sorts of interpretations like that can be done and obviously it's really complicated because you're trying to look at people's thoughts just by blood flow in a brain so it's not really an exact science and there's been some papers recently showing that fMRI studies really aren't that scientifically valid because they're such small sample sizes. Like in this case, there were only five individuals, but it's kind of the best we can do right now. So you take what you can out of it and you hope you can learn a little something. And the simpler the study, the better. If you try to extrapolate too much from it, it can be problematic. But I think this study is pretty simple. So hopefully it doesn't have those problems. 
So basically, they had three settings that they exposed these baby Nile crocodiles to. They flashed red and green lights at them. Right. (laughs) They played simple sounds, which were what they said were random chord noises. And then they played complex sounds, which was apparently part of the Brandenburg Concerto Number 4 by Bach. (laughs) So classical music. And apparently that's a standard sort of song that they play when they're doing these fMRI studies. I'm guessing on humans because they said they hadn't done crocodilians in an MRI before. (laughs) (laughs) But what they were doing in the study was pretty simple. They just wanted to see which parts of the brain were associated with sight and hearing. So it's probably a good way to study it. And they got pretty consistent results among the five crocodilians. So that also kind of lends support to it working well. And basically, it wasn't a huge, crazy finding. The areas of the brain that we thought were associated with sight and hearing were what lit up in the MRI as getting increased blood flow when they flashed lights at them or played sounds, respectively. The cool thing about it is that it shows this brain structure that we had kind of assumed previously was associated with these different mechanisms. And it's also similar to a lot of other amniotes. And amniotes are basically all dinosaurs and mammals and other reptiles, as well as a few other guys. Anything that has all placentals and then most land animals (laughs) are amniotes. And what they think is that the fact that we're seeing this sort of structure and confirming the structure might mean that amniote brains have a lot in common which would mean that it's a shared feature going back 300 million years and therefore that humans kind of have a similar sort of brain structure to dinosaurs and birds which is pretty neat that is and it also kind of confirmed that our guesses so far about say when we talk about t-rex and it had this big lobe in one part of its brain and therefore we thought it had a good sense of vision And looking at these crocodilians, it does look like, at least in crocodilians, that section is also for vision, sort of kind of reaffirms the fact that these previous guesses were probably right. So pretty neat. I wonder what they thought about Bach. (laughs) Right. I think it might be easier with crocodilians because with humans, you might associate that song with something and then different parts of your brain start lighting up because you're thinking about like a relative or the first time you heard the music or something, but like a couple week old crocodilian probably doesn't have all these associations it's probably just like what is the sound trying to make sense of it like what do i do what does this mean yeah (laughs) what animal could make this sound this is crazy and up next we've got an article from paludicola i think by ryan clayton and what he looked at was a new dinosaur paleopathology or basically injury which a lot of people i know like to hear about so this one was on a diplodocus And this Diplodocus specimen was found near Thermopolis, Wyoming. And basically it has an injured hip, which, quote, shows signs of possibly being purulent, which I had not read the word purulent before, but it means pus-filled. That's a much nicer (laughs) way of saying it. Yeah. Also, ouch. Yeah, you don't want that going on in your hip. It's the first Diplodocus injured hip, which has been reported. And they're uncertain of the cause, although they said, quote, one can speculate that a fall or stomp from another animal could be responsible for the injury. I guess that's the kind of ways you might injure a hip. It's hard to, like, fracture a hip. You've got to take a pretty good fall or a pretty hard impact in order to get injured like that. So those are probably the better causes you could expect. And I think they said it was partially healed. If it became pus-filled, obviously, that's... Oh, that sounds so painful. Yeah, but it wouldn't have died immediately, you know, because he wouldn't have gotten to that phase. Ah, but the poor Diplodocus. Yeah, not great. And (laughs) they mentioned, too, that there have been these theories in the past that Diplodocus might have been able to rear, but they think... Not that one. Yeah, exactly. They don't think this one could have anymore, and that might have limited its ability to eat or otherwise stay alive. Oh, Harsh, harsh yeah. times. Yeah, you don't want a broken hip. It's not good. You can't go on bed rest for a few weeks <laughs> in a cast if you're a Diplodocus. You just got to 
deal with it, I guess, try to walk around anyway. Well, it couldn't. Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe it could, but it definitely couldn't rear. Yeah. That's rough. That is rough. What's also rough, or maybe it's more complicated, in Germany, there's a lot of stuff going on about museums returning exhibits to ex-colonies right now. The Guardian reported on this. So the German culture minister, Monica Grutters, gave new guidelines to the quote, restitution of objects from colonial contexts, end quote. And that seems like there's a lot of complications. But the reason I bring this up is because there's talk about the Brachiosaurus in the Berlin Museum of Natural History, although that one is likely to remain put. The Brachiosaurus, it came from an excavation in 1909 from Tanzania, quote, two years after colonial powers in German East Africa had squashed an armed uprising known as the Maji Maji Rebellion, end quote. And a three-year research project looked into the conditions of that dig. They found that it was under fair pay. And the museum's director, Johann Vogel, said that the Brachiosaurus, which is the tallest mounted skeleton in the world, is a live research object that is pretty expensive for them to maintain. So from the Guardian article, it said, Speaking at a meeting with the German foreign minister, Heiko Maas, in Dar es Salaam, Mahia, and said the dinosaur does not belong to Germany or Tanzania, but should be considered a piece of world heritage and praised the museum's treatment of the remains. Oh, also, the Tanzanian government is a recipient of German development aid. So instead of restituting the skeleton to Tanzania, Vogel said that the museum was proposing a program where Berlin would help train up Tanzanian paleontologists and technical workers to explore the large uncharted sections of the Tendaguru Formation. Interesting. Yeah, <laughs> this reminds me of the British Museum with the, what is it, all the archaeological stuff from Greece and Egypt and yeah, yeah where they're like we'll give it back to you as soon as you have a really world-class museum that you can house this in <laughs> yeah and it's it's such a like catty response because it's like you can't be trusted with your own history kind of thing and I don't know I don't really like that response but there's some validity to it especially with things that are more fragile like potentially fossils where you might want to keep them in more of a controlled humidity and temperature, and definitely you need to maintain the mount and all that kind of stuff. But we've seen dinosaur skeletons mounted in tiny, simple museums, and they do a great job with them. So I don't, yeah, I think they could handle it if they really wanted it back. But they shouldn't take it back just for the sake of taking it back. They should at least have somewhere to display it, not just like, well, we want it because it's ours and we're going to hide it away in some back vault somewhere. So I don't know that the Tanzanian government's specifically asking for it because the article was talking about the president of France kind of started this trend of like, we're going to mm, give things back. And this is the Germany's response to that. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Like they're worried, they're trying to be preemptive about it and just like do the right thing. Yeah. That's good. I really like the idea of kind of starting the paleontology program or kickstarting it into another gear in Tanzania because that's really where a lot of this goes. If you have a lot of interested paleontologists and a lot of people working on it in the area, then the museums and all that kind of stuff follows. So hopefully that happens. The more paleontologists and the more places, the better. We always need more fossils. <laughs> Speaking of more paleontologists, well, this actually involves paleontologists and biologists and other scientists, but a bunch of them met at the Royal Society's Sheesley Hall, I think it's, I don't know how it's pronounced, but in Buckinghamshire, UK, for the Tail Murphy International Scientific Meeting Sexual Selection Patterns in the History of Life Meeting. Oof, mouthful. <laughs> so... Over the course of two days, they had sessions on sexual selection and macroevolution, identification of sexual selection in fossils, and a whole bunch of other stuff. And Scientific American wrote a post that covered it. Some of the sessions were about dinosaurs. Caleb Brown, for example, had a talk on ornithischian display structures and how certain features evolved quickly and had more variation, and he used modern animals for comparison. There was also a talk on the crests on theropod skulls and, quote, ongoing work that involves study devoted to the bizarre often ridiculously flamboyant galliforms, argus pheasants, and so on, are so crazy that we'd have a really hard time taking them seriously if they were only known as fossils. Yeah, very <laughs> true. Yep. And then, of course, there were poster sessions, including some on sexual dimorphism in ceratopsians and the functions of tail clubs in ankylosaurus. So it sounds like it was a pretty good event. Yeah, definitely. 
it is kind of a bummer because a lot of display structures are soft tissue or even just like coloration patterns and things like that. So you know that from the fossil record, we're only just getting a tiny glimpse of it. So, you know, we know the ceratopsian ones, for example, because they had huge horns. But some of the other animals must have had display structures that weren't horns. Yep. <laughs> and we just have no idea. It's up to our imagination at this point. Yeah, really. Like a frill on a Dilophosaurus. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. <laughs> Next, I think it was last year, Jack Horner kind of retired. Semi-retired. But he's not really retired because he's working on a 3D hologram exhibit to show what dinosaurs looked like. And he's working with base hologram. And the idea is to make people feel like they're on a dig or in a lab or even just out and about with dinosaurs in the wild. Yeah. So the dinosaurs are going to be brightly colored like birds. Speaking of, we don't really know what they look like, but we think or we can experiment or imagine. And the plans to have multiple traveling exhibits ready by next spring and then put them in museums and science centers and any places that may help spur debate about how colorful and feathery dinosaurs may have been. Horner's also worked with Microsoft to make dinosaur holograms in VR and AR, and he said that this tech can be used in labs as well. Quote, what we do now is when we want to envision something, we get an artist to paint it. Now we're going to be able to create a 3D immersive experience a lot better than a painting, end quote. Yeah. When I read that, my first thought was, what about all the great sculptures? Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Because to me, a sculpture is so much more in your face and like, kind of enjoyable to look at. You can walk around it and see it from all these angles and all that kind of stuff. But when he started talking about wanting to have multiple traveling exhibits and things like that, that it made a lot more sense to me because these things are really hard to move and the good ones usually don't move. <laughs> the cheap ones, people move all over the place, but the really high quality, really awesome dinosaur sculptures and animatronics tend to just sit in one place. And they're really expensive too and very difficult to update. But with something like a hologram, you could imagine updating it periodically and definitely and traveling more. a lot easier. Yeah. yeah, that could be really cool. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing how it all turns out. In Kansas, the museum at Prairieville in Overland Park has been struggling financially. And Kansas City covered in great detail about the museum and its struggles. But the museum opened in May 2014. It's lost millions. Apparently revenue from ticket sales weren't as high as they predicted. But there's been a turnaround since about last year. The museum's still struggling, but they're making changes. They're adding packages. There's something like preschool museum membership packages. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they've also are collaborating with Fat Brain Toys to have a discovery box is mailed monthly to kids ages three to five. They're working on a VR experience where they make content for other museums or to sell online. And they're also creating education courses and guides. And they have temporary exhibits. The current one, if you want to visit, is called Modern Dinosaurs. That shows a pachycephalosaurus fighting a velociraptor as one of the things on display. Although that one is probably ending soon because the next one will be in June. And it's called Savage Ancient Seas. Oh, yeah. We've talked about that one a few times. Cool. But now that leads me into all the upcoming dinosaur events. So the Charles B. Phillips Library in Newark, Illinois has a dinosaur program. On May 31st, visitors can hold dinosaur bones as part of the T-Rexplorers event. Jeez. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and you can see a Triceratops and T-Rex. The event's free, but you will need tickets. I think T-Rexplorers looks better in writing than it sounds because it's just explorers with an R in front. But when you say it, it just sounds so Doesn't quite ridiculous. roll off the tongue. No. <laughs> In Cincinnati, Ohio, the Rheingeist Brewery has a dinosaur specimen on display of Galliomopus. So to celebrate, the brewery also launched a dinosaur-themed beer, Brittle Brain, which is described as, quote, an effervescent, fruity, and slightly spicy Belgian-style golden ale, end quote. And the Galliomopus specimen came from the Cincinnati Museum Center, which is currently undergoing renovations, so they've also put up other displays at the University of Cincinnati the CVG Airport, and Cincinnati Public Library. Okay, so now we know what they were, the special thing they were going to display in that joint <laughs> yep. release was. I think that's cool. It's in a brewery. Yeah. If you're looking for fun dinosaur activities this summer, Lifehacker posted a list of family-friendly dinosaur digs. It includes the Museum of Western Colorado, ages 5 and up. It's 55 to 175 per person. The Wyoming Dinosaur Center for kids 8 to 12 with adult supervision. 
and that one's less than $20 a person. The Judith River Dinosaur Institute, which is about $1,700 for one week. It's a whole dig. The Tate Geological Museum at Casper College, for if you're 16 and over, you pay $800 for five days. There's also the Dinosaur State Park, which is only $6 per person. And all of these sites, you may have noticed, they're all in the U.S. Yep, and we'll have a link if you want to check out that list. And they link to those places. <laughs> yeah. Go to the rabbit hole. Links, links within links. Yeah. <laughs> in Riverside, California, you can now buy dinosaur themed milkshakes at one of their malls, the Galleria at Tyler. I think it, the shop's called Sweetasaur. It's a pretty good name. They have things like Ice Age Shake, which has cotton candy around the rim, Classic Jurassic, which is a vanilla shake with a cinnamon roll. And Meteor Madness, a chocolate shake with a chocolate bundt cake with yellow whipped cream that's supposed to look like the meteor hitting or something. It sounds sounds like way too much for me, although it'd be interesting to see how it looks. <laughs> they also have dinosaur-shaped ice cream cones for their Waffleosaurus Rex. And then a T-Rex, not animatronic, but kind of like a ride, a thing kids can ride in the corner. Mm, while like there. you put a quarter in it and it bumps up and down sort Something of thing. like that, yeah. It's like the whole thing is very dinosaur themed. The idea was to be very, very niche. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. It sounds like they were, they're going for the kid palette with all the sugar, sugar on sugar on sugar. Yeah, I was reading <laughs> that. My, first, I got to the cotton candy. I was like, oh, that's interesting. And then I just kept reading, oh, that's too much sugar for me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But I'm sure they look pretty. Yeah. Speaking of kids, we've mentioned this before, but dinosaur fingerlings are now for sale in the U.S. It started on May 18th. They're available in stores and online at Walmart, Target, and Amazon. Just as a reminder, there's four rafters named Stealth, Blaze, Fury, and Razor. They're mm -hmm. Yeah. They cost $15 each, and they will react to touch, motion, and sound. They have 40 different sounds and animations. And apparently, they know the difference between being petted or poked, and they will react differently. Yeah, I still want to get, like, all of them and put one on each finger and just see what happens. Just like the pictures. Oh, do they show that? Yeah. Of having all of them? <laughs> yeah, I guess they would want to sell all of them. <laughs> Why buy one when you could buy all of them? <laughs> Maybe I only want to buy one now. I feel like I'm getting tricked. <laughs> I think you're going to end up with all of them. I might. <laughs> And now we get into the Jurassic World news because, of course, we have Jurassic World news. <laughs> We're only a couple weeks out. So Fandango, which sells movie tickets, has a new prop shop in its store, and you can buy Jurassic World merch. So, for example, they have a $400 limited edition Jurassic Park hatched Velociraptor egg, which, I don't know, I think that sounded cooler than it looked. Yeah, an empty egg shell. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> but they also have a one-of-a-kind $25,000 wall-mounted head prop of Indominus Rex, which was, quote, hand-molded and hand-painted by artisans on the Universal Studios backlot. This, however, only ships in the U.S. That's way too much. And it's not even a real dinosaur. You go for a TRX sculpt. <laughs> it would be much cheaper and better. And an actual dinosaur. That's just ridiculous. <laughs> so now we know garrett's feelings on this it would be one thing if it was in the movie but this is just like something somebody made it's like a licensed prop true, true. for twenty five thousand dollars that's ridiculous but don't get, buy that i guess you got people who work at universal who worked on this yeah i don't know <laughs> something else <laughs> anyway moving on last week was national dinosaur day so to celebrate Claire Deering, you know, from Jurassic World, we're still on that, had a video encouraging people to adopt a dino to save them. And on adoptadino.com, you can choose a dinosaur and you can also learn facts about different dinosaurs. And then you get a certificate of adoption. It's like buying a star. Yeah. <laughs> That's a maybe even less real. <laughs> free. Oh, okay. Well, if it's free, then why not? That changes everything. <laughs> does it <laughs> anyway they're really specific dinosaurs too like i just adopted an eight-year-old apontosaurus oh did you get to choose that or you just got it by chance you get to choose oh, okay i was gonna say it's like they knew <laughs> <laughs> no i chose on purpose <laughs> and last college humor released a short 
clip or video of Owen Grady and Claire Deering trying to check a dinosaur in as a service animal on a flight <laughs> of blue. That's pretty great. Yeah. They're trying to say that that's going to help me with my anxiety. <laughs> yeah. And the guy's like, I'm getting anxiety just being here next to this caged velociraptor. <laughs> yeah. And then they try to convince him that no, Blue is well trained and Blue is shaking in the cage. And then they yell, Blue, eat your pole. <laughs> yeah. And they shove a pole in there. <laughs> yeah. While it's already eating the pole. Yeah. It's pretty funny. It's It's a really good video. So we'll post the link so you can watch it. And before we get into our interview, we have another word from TRX Dinosaurs. Again, they make innovative puppets and posable sculptures and animatronics. You can see lots of cool stuff that they've worked on or are working on on their Instagram at TRX Dinosaurs and also more information on their website at trxdinosaurs.com. We recently saw a couple posts on Twitter and Instagram from the ALF Museum because they got one of their baby T-Rexes. I think it was actually, I think it's a baby Allosaurus puppet. Oh, you're right. You're right. It's called Alfie the Allosaurus. <laughs> he made his debut at Comic-Con Revolution in Ontario, California recently. Cool. Yeah, so there's all kinds of pictures. Such a cute little baby dinosaur. Yeah. Yeah, those puppets are really popular, the baby T-Rex and the baby Allosaurus. So you can get your own puppet or posable sculpture or animatronic by going to trxdinosaurs.com and telling them what you want. And sometimes people say, I want one just like that other one you already made. <laughs> <laughs> but you could also come up with anything else because they make everything custom to order. So you can specify like even something like an eye color, probably even the color of the body. You can work it out with TRX Dinosaurs to see just kind of what sort of dinosaur you want to make. So they have a whole form you fill out, and since it's made to order, you can customize it to your liking. Yes, but customized, but also scientifically accurate. The baby T-Rex, I think, is a little bit Jurassic World style, so they have a little bit of leniency there. <laughs> but uh, yeah, definitely realistic dinosaurs are done very well. And if you haven't already heard then you haven't been listening to our show, but <laughs> <laughs> we're giving away a Velociraptor, which was made by TRX Dinosaurs. And the giveaway is open to residents of the US and Canada, except Quebec and where prohibited. There's no purchase necessary, one entry per household per episode limit, and complete rules are on our website. Since Jurassic World is now less than a month away, you got to get in on this while it's still available. And this week's link to enter is bit.ly slash giveaway 183 if you haven't noticed every episode link is the same as the episode number at the end <laughs> and then this one's just giveaway with a capital g and that link is also in our show notes in case you forget so if you want to win a velociraptor dinosaur valued at 500 dollars, then click the link and enter the giveaway and now for our interview with Dr. Elizabeth Rega. Today, we get to chat with Dr. Elizabeth Rega, who is a professor of anatomy and associate vice provost for academic development and academic affairs at Western University of Health Sciences. She's also a consultant for the animation and gaming industries and has worked on projects including Disney's Dinosaur, and she specializes in human and non-human primate anatomy. Well, thank you so much for being with us today. It is my pleasure to join you. <laughs> so pretty recently, I got to see you give a talk on visual narrative and successful anatomy teaching at the Society for Integrative and Comparative Biology Conference. Could you just, for our listeners who were not able to see that talk, <laughs> give give us, I guess, any, an overview of, of what it is you were uh, presenting? Yeah, well, I think one of the things that the scientific community is beginning to realize is that we can't only rely on the appeal of our message to get out there to the wider public. I mean, science is changing our lives, mostly for the better, sometimes for the worse. And it's the kind of tool in people's toolkit that you want them to have. You want them to have that ability to think scientifically and analytically. And, you know, in many ways, many of us are hoping that they'll also eventually bring that to the ballot box when they vote. So more than ever, I think scientists are realizing uh, that in terms of policy decisions and practical utility, we've got to communicate science better. But 
you know, as you've noticed from my overly long sentence, many of us also have studied for so long that we maybe lose our message. And it was about getting back to, you know, a first principles. And for me, because I've spent time going between medical school teaching, doing research on ancient disease and fossil animals, and strangely, getting out to the film industry, particularly animation and teaching them anatomy, gradually these things are coming together to make me realize that even though I'm a wordy person, the picture is really a vital part of that process. So I challenged myself and took things that I had learned from teaching animators who are also visual people and started constructing, say, a series of binary comparisons, side by sides. The idea that we're going to use some principles of human psychology to get at people's way of assimilating images. You know, you have a challenge on a podcast because you're creating these visual images for your listeners. And I, I've heard captivating storytellers who do exactly that, take you into beautiful landscape and show you a mushroom on a tree and then talk to you about what that tree's meaning is to his people and then talking about the medicinal properties of the mushroom. And that keeps actually, as that visual storytelling goes, it keeps a, a room riveted visually. And if you're not on a podcast, but in person or have video available, the images are critical critical to the message, and yet scientists often pay scant attention. So that's the long way around the block to saying what made me successful in animation teaching and thinking visually with animators and leaving out the jargon really has to come to inform my, my teaching the medical students and into the general public. I think, yeah, going along that, one of my favorite examples from your talk was you talked about how only mammals have facial expression muscles, which I had never thought about before. And then you showed these photos of iguanas. And I think you said like, this iguana is happy, this iguana is angry, but every iguana picture, they looked the same. <laughs> and then that was interesting because that is a challenge when it comes to say animating dinosaurs, like for Disney's dinosaur movie. So I guess what are some of the ways that artists can make these characters that aren't necessarily mammals more realistic? Oh, and yet believable. I That is an excellent anecdote to bring up because I think it's a very telling story. Just for your listeners who weren't able to be at the conference, I had the pleasure of working with paleo artist David Krentz, also an animator, at the time that we were uh, looking at dinosaur. And, you know, there are some real issues involved in bringing that world to life. And it was a tremendous opportunity right at the very beginning of digital animation to really bring people into a story and some images that are unusual. And, of course, animators are very much like scientists in that they're kind of behind the scenes and embrace their geekiness. And it's lovely. It's wonderful. Our, our labs and their... their offices and carols look very similar. We have lots of toys and lots of creative visual images. We love what we do and we're enthusiastic about doing what's accurate, right? And that's where it comes in with dinosaurs. Dinosaurs, like iguanas, do not nurse. They hatch out of eggs and they don't have to have muscles to nurse with. But mammals, all mammals, have movable faces because of the nursing issue. And that becomes such an important part of our communication, looking at people's facial expression, particularly as primates where we live and die by that, that for the animators trying to tell a persuasive story is very difficult because you involve your readers in the emotion and the struggle of the hero's journey with more than words. And it was a challenge enough to try to say, okay, talking dinosaurs. And I think many people hoped that the dinosaurs wouldn't even talk. But, you know, once you've moved into talking dinosaurs, the question has to become not did dinosaurs talk, because probably not, not the way we talk. But more importantly, if dinosaurs did talk, what would their muscles look like and how would their face move? And that's where you walk in the, you know, the black, you know, the white, and then you walk creatively in the gray. And that's the kind of thinking that I think, you know, that, that presents something in a student's mind. 
hearing that story, now you won't forget that mammals suck, as it were. Suck, have facial muscles, and it really presented a challenge. And I think everyone knows that narrative is power, story is power, and there are visual stories. And I like that sequence because it allows me to go from the real, which is very realistic dinosaur skull, to the fantasy, facial muscles on this dinosaur and what this dinosaur would then look like talking. It is, I think, an ability of many folks to kind of walk that subtlety back and forth between fantasy and reality. And ultimately for animation, it's part of the, the beauty of the art bringing to life. You have to turn those examples back to our students who maybe consume animation but don't create it, you know, our doctors and future voters, and to let them in on the stories. Lift the curtain behind the science so that, like a Christmas tree, you're hanging fat on a structure you already have. <laughs> I like that analogy. It is, it is. And for the animators, it becomes even more critical because I say, look, you don't need to know the the words for these structures are the ornaments on the tree. But if you don't have ornaments on the tree, you still have the tree. And here's the tree. Mammals have muscles of facial expression. Other animals do not. Oh, that for them is a tree moment. And then so I can kind of use both of them to the advantage of the other. And so like so many other parts of my job, I think of myself as a concierge, kind of going back and forth and bringing what's useful from both fields, hopefully together. I imagine there can be a lot of conflict. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes and no. I will say that I am acutely aware of my privileged position teaching at the graduate level for health profession students because everybody has to be nice to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, high school is a very different different thing. My, my students are, are terrific, and even if they're bored with me, they pretend to pay attention, and for that I'm grateful. And but not everybody's got a captive audience of highly educated, you know, medical students. I find that I get better results even out of these high achieving students if I put images into their lectures, if I can make the science a story. And frankly, when I'm talking to high school students, it's absolutely essential uh, is that the, the, the further sort of toward the origin of the educational story you go, the better the teacher actually has to be to try to engage people in, in the story and what's fun. And so, uh, you know, that is the only way, I think, for me to really captivate these students is to remind them what they've seen. You've all seen this. Did you like it? Did you want to know the science behind the story? Oh, guess what? It's anatomy. And by that time, you've hooked them. They're like, all right, I'll bite. And then a couple, you know, make them laugh and use that neurobiology. You're going to squirt a little dopamine into your receptors and your brain literally ends up changing its receptivity to the message. And so that works with artists as well? I think it works with all of us. We're all monkeys. <laughs> <laughs> we're all, you know, we're all the eight variety descended from the monkey tree and we're very visual. That's one of the characteristics of primates. We're very social and communicative in general and those visual pictures have a lot of power. It's really amazing to look at the growth, say, of visual markets where disseminated media and streaming becomes available like India and look at 60% rises in subscriptions over a year. The appeal of the visual is so strong that as scientists, we can't afford to be left behind by that. We have to embrace that and not be scared by it because it's exciting and fun and it really is who all of us are. The artists don't own it. We just have to use what they do that's so successful and help that inform our teaching. Yeah. So since it's I Know Dino, I, I do have to ask you about your dinosaur projects and research. <laughs> Charismatic megafauna. They're, they're such a good entree into people's imagination because we just need to know they're crazy. And there's craziness about dinos. What craziness do you want to know? Do you want to know about the T-Rex project? Yes, to start. <laughs> yeah. Well, one thing we've got working uh, in my lab, and it's a project that several of my students have been involved in, is, is looking at some things on T-Rex. Uh, T-Rex is a fascinating animal for so many reasons. It's huge. 
it's late in the Cretaceous, it is popular in the media, and and so many of these things, you have questions instantly in looking at something that enormous and and yet in, in so many ways so successful. And we had the opportunity to work on a specimen from the L.A. County Museum, which is a single thigh bone, a femur. And we needed to do a cross-section in my lab, essentially a microscope slide. And normally I can pick those slides up with my thumb and finger. And if you do a cross-section of an entire dinosaur femur at that size, I've got something the size of a dinner plate. So that was challenge number one. How do you scale that up? And there's an interesting story about veterinary students and medical students being involved and taking it out to a rock cutting facility and then coming back to the lab and embedding and grinding. And, you know, years later, we have a beautiful, beautiful physical specimen. It's not the typical way large specimens will be prepared. Most large specimens will be cut into pieces, prepared separately, and then reassembled digitally. But the curator at the L.A. County Museum, Dr. Luis Tiaki had insisted. He said museums are there because people want to see the real thing. There's that fascination with, you know, it's real. So we had to have a real cross-section. So your listeners can go look at this cross-section at the L.A. County Museum in the Hall of Dinosaurs on the mezzanine level. And they can see the bone that it was cut from. And like cutting a tree microscopically, dinosaur bone will tell you a story. It will tell you a story of its growth, and it will tell you a story of its response. And what is so cool is after all of this specimen preparation, which is still going on, we're learning things about these dinosaurs that we didn't even really think to ask the question before about. So we're looking at, you know, how the bone is responding potentially to a great big muscle attachment um, that is something that's predominant in theropod dinosaurs. It's called the caudofemoralis, but that's just a fancy term for the tail femur muscle. And it's a big leg retractor. So in a big thighed, two-legged dinosaur like T-Rex, you can see that that would be very powerful. And what it's doing to the bone is not what we expected it to do. And so it's interesting that we've, we're on to a new story that we didn't anticipate having because of doing such an unusual project because of another goal. So now I could show you pictures of that histology. And since you're primed with the story, you already want to know, well, what, what is it that you found? How is it different than what was before, right? I was about to ask, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and that's, that's what our, our peer-reviewed publications are for. We're, we're finding holes where we thought we would find solid bone. We're finding porosity. But we don't think that that's a mark of disease or osteoporosis. We actually think that it is a localized biomechanical adaptation to that kind of pull. So it's a surprising manifestation. And now it gets us back into general questions of bone biology. And, you know, dinosaurs are natural experiments for us. We can look at dinosaur relatives like birds or dinosaur kind of distant cousins like alligators. but If we're going to actually look at the things that dinosaurs invented that made them special, and there's a lot of cool things they invented and reinvented, you got to read the bones themselves. And you can read them like a book. And here, once again, I'm teaching with image. But image embedded in story becomes so effective that I'm hoping right now your listeners have a picture of a dinosaur cross-section the size of a dinner plate with it looking a little bit like tree rings and then looking at these muscle attachments and seeing these holes or pores that make it look a little like styrofoam. And you're thinking, why would it look like styrofoam just where it needs to be strongest? And that's kind of the way we all have to shift our storytelling is if we want to grab people by their emotions as well as their intellect, we have to be just as good a storytellers as folks that you know, have different stories to tell. And that is a challenge to not (laughs) rely on so many big words, but to also not be afraid of our words and to use those words to paint a picture and to try to emulate those great communicators who can bring us along. Yeah. It's definitely a skill that needs to be developed. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it is. And I just don't know. I I don't think that that our our younger academics necessarily have the time to spend 35 or 40 years learning it. 
I would love to be able to give a boost up with what I've learned and, and see how they take it farther because it is not a technology issue. It's an approach issue. The technology is a tool that one uses, but mere words with the right mindset should be enough to kind of move you if you understand the nature of how people best learn. And boy, I'm always, as you can already tell, fighting against words. I just am wordy. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, my children know that all too well. Yeah, we can both be wordy too. That's why we have a podcast. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, you know, it's context is everything, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I'll tell you, you know, 53 minutes past the hour, it's not what your students want either because they're <laughs> shutting their laptop and shutting their mind. <laughs> and, and who can blame them? It's, you're competing out there. It's a lot of information and images that we are now competing against. And when I first started teaching, I could use a well-organized slide tray full of ectochrome slides. And I would be the hottest thing out there because I had slides and pictures. And now everybody has slides and pictures. What are you going to do to be special? Are you going to grab them in a competitive visual environment where the thing in, that's buzzing in their pocket has so much more motivation and interest for most of them than you do? Oh, it's, it's just, I think, about maintaining our ability to persuade. And really, you know, it's all education or entertainment, isn't it? all education or entertainment, and at its best, it's both. That's my truth, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> <laughs> I like that, yeah. I don't yeah, think I'd, I'd, yeah. heard, I'd thought of it in those exact terms, but that, yeah. Makes well, and I think that's what you're doing is reaching out, isn't it, education? Yeah, we try. <laughs> 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 so I'm looking at your site right now, and there's also... Uh, he did an article on appropriate extant model organisms for dinosaur disease. Is that related to what you were finding with the T-Rex, the cross-section? Yeah, that's, that's an excellent jump there because, in fact, we all know that the questions you ask will determine what you end up finding out. And for disease, what's we're looking for is a departure from the normal. And yet, if you don't know what the normal is, it's hard to say what the abnormal then really becomes. And with dinosaurs in particular, as we're looking for decoding a bone response and saying, wow, I see bone that is full of little holes right here in those holes when I look at them microscopically are erosive. What organism or infection would do that? Then you, who do you look at? You look at birds which are obviously very distantly related to dinosaurs. You try to look at terrestrial birds, but terrestrial birds are, of course, even further removed because they have re-evolved from an, an aerial form back down to a terrestrial form. Or, you know, you look at the bone of the dinosaurs itself and you read what the cells are telling you because the preservation is remarkable in many cases that you can see the remains of what surrounded the embedded cells, and you can see how the cells laid down the bone. So you can't rely just on looking at relatives because the relatives are so departed. And also, we call those crown claves. I know a lot of your listeners will be experienced in that. Those crown claves are pretty derived. And we're making guesses. And the appropriate model for dinosaurs really depends on what system you're looking at biomechanically. And then we've got a real scale issue. Size does very different things. We just don't have dinosaur-sized birds anymore. <laughs> so, right? And they'd be hard to fry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you know, my answer to that is we look at lots of things. Surprisingly, given some of the things that dinosaur bone does, like it grows quickly, like it responds very rapidly to ambient force and the way it lays down it actually has some points of resemblance to human bone I mean, as a matter of fact lots of points of resemblance to human bone and mammalian bone and i have to tell you when i'm teaching certain basic bone biology to my medical students i'll put up 
a microscopic slide of dinosaur bone talk about all of the features that are important to them, features of remodeling and the Herversian system. And then just before I change the slide, I'll say, oh, by the way, that was a piece of dinosaur bone. <laughs> it's all the same in humans. And doesn't that teach something too? Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, my answer to the appropriate model is it depends. One can't just pick birds would be wonderful, except that since that aerial lifestyle became such an important sort of morphological trajectory for birds, their bones are hollow. So the things that we would look at in dinosaur bones, which are almost solid, you can't use modern birds for. Terrestrial birds have refilled those bones, but there's no guarantee that what they did is the same as what dinosaurs did, and the, the bone doesn't look as similar as it might do to a mammalian bone, which seems counterintuitive, and yet there it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, and this is coming together with a lot of, now that we have genetic data on speciation as well, we're finding that it isn't really a tree of life. It's kind of like a shrub, and a lot of these nodes reticulate, that reticulated evolution. In other words, species kind of branch off and then come back together, and, and genes get shuffled around. At the same time that we had that happen to dinosaurs over their successful 200 million year plus, you know, evolutionary trajectory on Earth, they have invented and reinvented a lot of different bone processes and reactions. And remember, at the same time now, when you're talking disease, we're adding an entire ecosystem into that. You know, we're not just talking about what we don't know about dinosaur growth and development. Now we're like, what? were the pathogens then that we know have evolved since then? And what kind of reactions did they incite? And how did that delicate balance get accomplished? They're big, deep, huge questions. And it's not just, well, I'm just going to compare it with the chicken. I think that's where we really have to come down to it here. There's a whole reason why poultry research is very prevalent, and yet Poultry research isn't going to be helpful if you're looking at wild animals, for example. You're not getting the death profiles at the advanced stages. And one of the fascinating things that people love about T. Rex is, you know, besides their obvious carnivore sexiness, is the fact that they're moderately long lived, you know, 27, 30, 32 years. And when they do that, they accumulate a ton of injuries over their life because they're tough, they live through. So it's not that they're sick, it's just that they're battered. Sort of thinking about, you know, someone who's a, a football player or a boxer or hockey player being from Detroit, I really should have thought of hockey right away. Those are incredibly fit people, but do they have fractured fingers? Sure. So I like to think that Sue the T-Rex would have worn a Red Wings jersey myself and had a couple teeth knocked out. But of course, they're not limited like mammals, are they? When you have continuous waves of replacement. Yeah, that'd be you know, nice. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting you brought up how birds aren't necessarily good correlates to non-avian dinosaurs. Every time I see one of those studies, I think they're kind of writing off about half of them anyway, because any kind of biomechanics you're talking about with a bird is going to be best related to theropods. Whereas if you're trying to imagine sauropods or some of the other like thyreophorans or other quadrupedal things, you're probably not learning much of anything really useful about dinosaurs. Well, you're making it a valid point, and it was one of the things that I was thinking about when I was working with a colleague of mine, Rob Holmes, on ceratopsians. And we're looking at, you know, what essentially were bunions in chasmosaurs. <laughs> Look at the, the number of actual kind of articulated chasmosaur hands that are out there. There's not that many. I mean, there's fewer than, say, a dozen. And when you look at them, he had three separate hands from two individuals, both of which had what were arguably bunions. So in investigating how that formed, it's a repetitive injury, but it's indicative of their posture. We ended up looking at rhino feet and elephant feet. And then also, who gets bunions? <laughs> Human feet. Because you're looking at, at the, and, and by looking at the biomechanical pattern of stress where this, essentially the thumb gets jammed, we kind of came up with the idea that that's showing that the, the hand, the manis is rolling when it contacts the ground and it allowed us to take a stab at reconstructing that posture, which as you know has been 
you know, a point of debate amongst paleontologists for what, 80 years? You know, was it a sprawling posture? Was it an upright posture? Was it somewhere in between? And what we showed from the thumb jamming evidence is that it varied depending on what part of the step cycle you're in, that they went from more sprawled to less sprawled depending on where in the stroke. And that really caused a rolling of the thumb against the ground and a pushing off that jammed the thumb. And with age, those would become kind of gnarly and jammed, just like gnarly jammed toes on human beings. So you have to take your analogs where you can get them. And I think where it's important is to go down into the fabric of the bone and say, what does the bone tell you is happening? There's a lot of process indicators in bone. And if you can read that, then it gives you more confidence and it gives us two lines of evidence. Now we don't have to rely on bipedal chickens and stuff to help us with sauropods because we can say, or as my chasmosaur example, we can look at similar size, similar habitus, and we can also, you know, maybe even affect our own reconstructions. I think the evidence of those bones show that the Chasmosaur hands, and that probably means all sorts of other related animals, was much more gathered and upright than it was splayed. You know, I think you can read the bones and see that a little bit more clearly. And, and those are always spirited discussions, often over beer with your colleagues. And we thought pathology brought a tool to the table. It, it, it brought, as you will, a knife to the fight. So I just, you know, to take an analogy one step too far, I hope I'm not bringing a knife to a gunfight. But, you know, I have used titles before, like pathology is the smoking gun for X and Y, because it gives us a different way of looking at it that isn't just analogy or arm waving. We've got a different line of evidence where we can test our suppositions and to circle back around to the T-Rex femur. You know, I was looking at this and I thought, what are the chances of me taking all of this time to work with students over a year and a half to grind a section of what looks to be normal bone, cutting it open and finding out it's pathological? That would be weird, given that what I study is pathology. So I had to interrogate myself very deeply. And that's when you're like, well, we don't have documentation of animals producing this kind of morphology at big muscle attachments. And yet once I started talking to people about it, other people came out of the woodwork and said, oh yeah, I've seen that too. That's weird, isn't it? So what are we finding out? You know, these little holes, like the portholes on ships, help resist the propagation of cracks. If you're pulling at right angles, you know, is it ever, have you ever thought, why are the windows on ships not square? They'd be cheaper. And it's because if you think about the hull of a ship, if you put a crack in it, a corner, that can start the material failing at that point. So if you don't have a point, you don't have a point for the crack to propagate from. So your punctures should be circular or circular form. And what do you know? We've got holes in the dinosaur bone that has a fibrolamellar structure, kind of a layered structure that can vary in its layeredness. And if you punch remodeling holes in that and put a shell of bone, if a crack does happen to propagate from enormous tension on the bone, then it stops at the porthole and doesn't go further. So maybe they're coming up with an adaptation for toughness of bone that we don't see. And gosh, you know, shouldn't we run out and patent that right now? Because maybe we should use that in some biomaterials. Yeah. I guess we don't have to deal with the same kind of stresses that <laughs> T-Rex had to deal with. <laughs> no, if we go ahead and extend our thigh, I can guarantee that we're not generating those stresses across the bone that the T-Rex is. And yet we don't think of the scale, do we? And that's where I think we're seeing a scale effect. And the other animal that this was seen in was hadrosaurus, where we've got a scale effect as well. So there's my prediction. And now I just need 100 coelophysis in my lab to cut up. Because that way I can have early and small and see if I'm right. So that's, I find it very exciting because what I do, I, I, I love going into the field and I love helping my colleagues, but I can't make a living looking for pathological bones because they're such a small percentage of the overall bone found anyway. So I have to rely on, you know, cooperation with others and then also follow the thread. Sometimes you pull a thread. 
and it unravels the sweater in a totally different way. I found that with, uh, you know, one of the projects I found very exciting was working on Dimetrodon, and everyone loves Dimetrodon. I know you guys love dinos, but of course, Dimetrodon gets to be honorary because it ends up in the plastic toy kits, doesn't it? But it's another one of those charismatic megafauna with that great big sail, and I was looking at what looked like simple fractures in Dimetrodon spines with another researcher, and he's like, yeah, cut it in half. This will be quick and dirty. You'll show the fracture callus, and we'll substantiate it. Well, we cut it, and it wasn't what we expected. And it turns out this has a highly, highly layered structure and extremely fast-growing. You can read from the bone that they go through a growth spurt. And then they have these desperate remodeling mechanisms to keep a bone that has been bent and to straighten it out. And you're like, whoa, not expected. These are supposed to be, you know, primitive. Well, a lot of the structures in the spines look like, no, they run fast. They have a growth spurt. And that a lot of the function of that sail may be more biomechanical than thermoregulatory. Because we're looking at a lot of sail material on the bottom of the spines, but the top of the spines kind of curl in every direction. It's rarely noted that in like the type specimens, you know, Romer's drawings, the top of those spines will curl like, I like to say, like Howard Hughes' fingernails. (laughs) Yeah. So now you got a mental image. (laughs) So a lot of that thermoregulatory hypothesis it falls down and it falls down even maybe quite literally in a crosswind. If you think about these animals caught in a crosswind, I think the top of their sails isn't continuous. I think they have a spiky top of the sail and those little grooves there have no evidence of vascularity. And it's really important for these to be upright and they're probably using their, you know, interspinous ligaments in a way that also helps with fast locomotion. So you see that this little study generates so many more questions than it answers, but isn't that kind of the fun of creativity of science? Yeah. Well, I was just thinking, if it, would it make sense to like pose these same questions to dinosaurs, something like Spinosaurus? There's a lot of oh, hypotheses. Well, yeah, of course it would. <laughs> so if only we had loads of Spinosaurus material that had to sunk in World War II, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah we don't yeah. have much. <laughs> we don't have much. But yeah, if you can find me a spinosaur spine, particularly with pathology, I'd be happy to go to town on that because there are exactly so many things we don't know. And yet, if, you know, if Spinosaurus really is semi-aquatic, we would a priori expect to see very different structures than we're seeing in Dimetrodon. I'd love to see it. But one of the things I'm thinking about, too, is, wow, the biomechanical structure of Dimetrodon spines is very architectural. Um, these gigahomogenes spines, when they get really big, are like I-beams in cross-section for similar reasons. And they get that I-beamness in their growth spurt. And I'm thinking, you know, there are some design considerations that are incredibly sophisticated in these early Permian tetrapods that mammals lost to their detriment. So we can't think about primitive and derived as being advanced and, you know, simple. Yeah, here, here I'm looking at, you know, over two seasons, an animal completely reorienting the base of its spine by remodeling that's very visible because of the layers. And I'm like, that's a fine control system. <laughs> animals that we kind of draw as if they're, you know, kind of slinking around the paleo swamp looking for something easy. And, you know, yet that's 280 million years ago. It's all fun, and some of it's dinosaur. A lot of it's dinosaur, but some of it is, as my early Permian tetrapod researcher colleagues would say, way more interesting than dinos. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, there's lots of partisan arguments that go around with that. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> so where's the best place for people to find out more about you and your work? Oh, well, that is a very good question. I would say that there are... If you're interested in the pathology end of things, there is an edited volume called The Complete Dinosaur. And it, I've provided some of the accounts of some of the pathology, including uh, the ceratopsian material. Dimetrodon paper uh, is published in Fieldiana. All of those things I should probably get you guys the links to. 
That'd nice. be great. We, we actually, do have a copy of the complete dinosaur, though, of do. course. It's, yeah, it's, it's one of our <laughs> favorites. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a couple of things, and then, you know, ultimately, I'm hoping that this year we can we can break through with my students and get our T-Rex femur out the door. It is it is such a big specimen that, you know, it's gone through multiple graduate students sort of treating it affectionately. And they're, all, they're all terrified because they know that, that you know, preparation is destruction. And there's nothing like sitting there and inadvertently sloughing off a 67 million year old piece of bone to to really kind of yeah take a hit at your self confidence. So we have to be bold in this lab. Yeah. <laughs> you know, hope that micro CT very soon becomes macro CT so that we can changes on these specimens at a much higher level. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. Well, thank you. It is always wonderful to get a chance to talk about science. Yeah. And it's great that you guys are out there doing this sort of job, getting the science out there to your listeners. Well, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Thanks again for the interview, Elizabeth. We had a really great time talking to you. And now on to our dinosaur of the day, Proceratosaurus, which is kind of mentioned in Jurassic Park because... We're going along with the Jurassic Park, Jurassic World theme and covering dinosaurs that are mentioned in the series. <laughs> Even ones which are only written on, say, an embryo cooler in Jurassic Park. Such as Proceratosaurus. <laughs> <laughs> Just as a random example. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, Proceratosaurus was a theropod that lived in the Jurassic in what's now England, and it was found in 1910 in Minchin Hampton during an excavation for a reservoir. They found a partial fragmentary skull of a subadult, its name means before Ceratosaurus, you may have guessed, the pro part. And the species name is in honor of F. Lewis Bradley, who found the specimen. And that species name is Proceratosaurus bradleyi. That's the type species, too. Arthur Smith Woodward first described the skull as Megalosaurus bradleyi. It was part of that wastebasket taxon, as many were. At the time Woodward described the skull, it was the most complete theropod skull known from Europe. That wasn't crushed and hard to study, like some Compsognathus and Archaeopteryx skulls. Woodward thought that it was an ancestor of Ceratosaurus, hence the name, and then Frederick von Huene agreed in the 1930s with this interpretation, though he thought that both were Silurosauria. Frederick von Huene renamed Megalosaurus bradleyi to Proceratosaurus bradleyi because of its nasal horn, which was similar to Ceratosaurus. Huene originally used the name Proceratosaurus in an illustrated phylogenetic scheme in 1923, and then officially named it in 1926. Proceratosaurus was thought to be an ancestor to Ceratosaurus because they had a similar small crest in their snouts, but now it's considered to be a Silurosaur and one of the earliest Tyrannosauroidea, which are basal relatives of Tyrannosaurs. Scientists re-examined all this in the late 1980s, and Gregory Paul thought that Proceratosaurus was a close relative of Ornitholestes because of the crest on the nose, though later it was found that Ornitholestes did not have a nasal crest. Paul also thought Proceratosaurus and Ornitholestes were primitive allosauroids and that the theropod Pivotosaurus was a junior synonym of Proceratosaurus, but it was later found that those two are two distinct genera. A phylogenetic analysis in the early 2000s found that Proceratosaurus was a Silurosaur. In 2010, Oliver Rauhut and others published a reevaluation of Proceratosaurus and concluded that it was a Silurosaur and a Tyrannosauroid and most closely related to Guanlong, a Tyrannosauroid from China. Proceratosaurus was small, it was about 9.8 feet or 3 meters long, and it was carnivorous, it had serrated teeth. It had small premaxillary teeth, the ones in the front, and large lateral teeth, the ones on the side, and it had enlarged nostrils and a head crest. It had a highly pneumatic skull, that means it had a lot of holes. And like other theropods, it was probably bipedal and had a long tail. You can see the type specimen in the London Museum of Natural History. It's a good museum, I hear. It is. And our fun fact of the day, I believe we've hinted at a few times recently, because there were a couple articles about it recently, but basically it's that duck-billed dinosaurs, so-called duck-billed dinosaurs, did not have duck bills. <laughs> <laughs> so there's been two good blog posts about this, one by Brian Sweetek, who had an article titled Shovel-Beaked, Not Duck-Billed Dinosaurs, and he goes into that kind of detail. And then there's also a recent one by Darren Nash, where he shows a really good example at the Los Angeles County Museum of an Edmontosaurus skull that preserves the keratin end of the beak. So basically, 
If you're familiar with Edmontosaurus, that's kind of the origin of this duckbill dinosaur because it really looks like a duckbill. I guess Hadrosaurus does a little bit too, but especially the end of the mouth is pretty flat. So on the skull at least. So it looks like a duck where when the two ends of the mouth, the upper and the lower parts of the mouth go together, it's just kind of a flat line that ends in just sort of a straight line across at the tip. And it's real shallow, just like a duck beak. But actually, the issue is that there was a keratin covering along the top of the mouth, the top of the beak in the front, that came down and covered the bottom of the beak. So when you look at it at the Los Angeles County Museum, where the keratin is actually preserved, almost all of the keratin is preserved at the end of this beak, it doesn't really look so much like a duck beak. It almost looks more like a snout like you see on most dinosaurs. Oh, Yeah, so when Brian Sweetex said shovel beaked, I think he's referring to that sort of overlap of the two. That's It's still not the best way to describe it. I don't think there's any real simple way to describe it because there's no real modern correlate. It's like there isn't a modern animal that you can just compare it to anyway. So if you want to read a little more about that, well, the links to both of those blog posts. But yeah, duck-billed dinosaur is not the best name. We still use it a lot of the time just because everybody knows what that is. <laughs> but yeah, just know that they don't really have duck bills. They have these keratin coverings that gave them more interesting looking beaks. Cool. And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss out on any new episodes. Also, check out our Patreon page if you want access to our exclusive content for Jurassic Park and Jurassic World. And our upcoming Japanese dinosaur museums that we're going to. We'll post some videos there for our patrons. Yeah. And of course, check out the show notes for a link for the Velociraptor giveaway. Thanks again. And until next time. Thank you for listening to I Know Dino. If you have any questions or comments about dinosaurs, we'd like to hear from you at plesiosaur at iknowdino.com. And for more information on dinosaurs, go to iknowdino.com or follow us on Google, Facebook, Tumblr, or Twitter at iknowdino.